If you were to ask people today, what is the worst man-made disaster in peacetime? They'd probably say something like, oh, the Titanic. 1912, 1,512 lives. Or they might say, oh, Chernobyl. And maybe a few hundred lives have gone to that. Or they might say, if they're being a bit more knowledgeable, when the Union Carbide plant blew up at Bhopal, and, and the number of people dead or injured by that may be as high as 10,000. But thalidomide outstrips all of those, ten times over and more. The thalidomide disaster probably destroyed more than 100,000 babies, injured a million adults, and yet it doesn't feature in, in the list that springs to people's mind. The dilemma for the Sunday Times in Thalidomide is this. We had the information that the compensation was inadequate. We had more than a suspicion that the manufacturer of the drug had been negligent. But the law of contempt meant that neither of these approaches to the story of Thalidomide could be published. By the 1960s, society was much more complex. Corporations had grown more powerful, more invasive in, in, for good and bad in people's lives. But nobody knew how complex, MPs didn't know, they hadn't got a clue. Parliament as an engine of investigation and inquiry was useless, nothing to compare with Congress. So it was like somebody being in a prison cell. The British press was like this. If anybody reached out their arms would hit the walls, the walls of libel, contempt of court, official secret sex, confidence. When we tried to expose the plight of thalidomide children who were born with their arms and legs, They'd lain without compensation, being born as trunks for 10 years. Why wasn't there a huge national scandal about it? Why? Because the law of contempt said you were not allowed to comment on a case before the courts. That was the situation. How could anybody stand for that? You, you look back on that, that Sunday Times uh, and you admire the courage of the man. He, he took on big vested interests uh, in the face of very difficult legal circumstances. And he okay. blasted open some of the, some of the um, legal challenges to journalism uh, in ways from which we've all benefited. My 
real interest in journalism begins actually when I was 12. The war was on. My father was driving steam trains. Occasionally, once every two years, we got a chance to go on a family vacation. And we went to Rill. We were walking along the beach, and there were a group of people lying down in the distance. And my dad stopped, which really exasperated me, on these, and started talking to them. And they were survivors of Dunkirk. Out from the hell that is Dunkirk, back from the steel thrust of the German war machine comes the BEF. I didn't realize till later, when I went into journalism, that he was doing what a good reporter did. He asked questions. What was it like? What, what, what happened? What, what was your equipment? And so on. And they gave him such a story of desperation. They felt they'd been let down by the Royal Air Force, by the French, about the Maginot Lion being a nonsense. And when we got back to the boarding house, we didn't stay in hotels, we stayed in boarding houses. There was a Daily Mirror front page up there. Bloody marvelous, bloody marvelous, it said about the evacuation. And then I thought, but my dad's telling a completely different story. Who's telling the truth? Think of 9-11 and what happened in the, ex in the rush to be patriotic. The British people and the American people actually went along with an atrocity, the invasion of Iraq. So what is the duty of a newspaper in those circumstances? Is it to keep up people's morale? Or is it to do the much more difficult job, still very difficult, of going against the grain of popular opinion and looking for the truth? His most high-profile and emotionally draining campaign also had its origins in the Second World War. I am the officer commanding the Regiment of Royal Artillery guarding this camp. The officers and men regard this job as a duty that has to be performed, and none of us are likely to forget what the German people have done here. The German company Chemie Grunenthal had been a soap and perfume manufacturer, but in 1946 it diversified to exploit a voracious post-war demand for antibiotics and sedatives. Authorities were concerned that the unsanitary conditions in which people were living were likely to lead to epidemics, and sedatives and sleeping tablets were much in demand by a people whose nerves were shattered. By the mid-50s, Germany was a calmer place. Chemie Grunenthal faced stiff competition from other pharmaceutical companies, and the demand for their sedatives and antibiotics had fallen to normal levels. They needed a bestseller, and they thought they'd found it in thalidomide, an addictive euphoric. At the time, barbiturates were much more prevalent than today and people were inadvertently overdosing in alarming numbers. An appealing selling point was that it was believed to be impossible to overdose on the drug. The particular focus on supplying thalidomide to pregnant women came about because at that time, the prevailing medical belief was that morning sickness was psychosomatic. And I've had this from the drug company salesmen themselves. They, they thought that if if a pregnant woman was being sick because she was just overexcited about how, being pregnant, you'd sedate her and she'd calm down and she'd stop being sick. 
Christmas Day, 1956. In Stolberg, Germany, a young, nervous, expectant father who worked as a chemist for Chemie Grunenthal was waiting for news from the delivery room. But the news he received was not what he'd hoped. His child was born with no ears. His wife had been given samples of the Chemie Grunenthal's wonder drug to help combat her morning sickness. That Christmas day saw the delivery of the world's first thalidomide baby. The fact that one of the very few women given the drug had had a deformed baby was not picked up on. And Kemi Grunenthal went ahead and marketed their product across the world. A handful of countries, including the US, refused it a license. But most accepted the manufacturer's test data on face value and allowed the drug to be prescribed. In 1958, it was licensed for use in the UK under the trade name Distaval. The active drug substance in both Distaval and Contagen was thalidomide. Well, I didn't even know I'd taken it. I felt unwell for a week. And um, Wednesday afternoon, closed the shop, decided to go around the corner, just a few yards around the corner to see my GP. And she said, I've got a new drug that's out, a miracle. She said the word miracle. Miracle drug is fantastic. You'll be okay. So I took the little bit of paper, not realizing I had accepted my death warrant that day. From the minute I got caught, I had that sickness. The chemist told me, like, I said, you know about these tablets? And he just said, oh, they're for helping you to sleep and, and sickness. So I took them, which they did, they was good, don't get me wrong. They were smashing when I, when I took them, you know, I felt real good. Vicky and I got married. Uh, she was 21, I was 22. After some months, Vicky told me she was pregnant. We were absolutely thrilled. And she went along to see her doctor, who said that he thought she's a bit anemic. So fine, so he gave her a prescription for iron tablets and one other. And I'd been asking her, can you feel the baby kick? And she used to say, well, not kick, but press. I started in labour at 10 past seven on the Saturday morning. And my husband always worked on the Saturday morning. And I just said to him, uh, you better get round and bring the midwife. And I just put my legs on the bed and she come and she went, oh my God. And the sleeves went up and no cut off and she just stabbed in. And she was born at 10 minutes to eight. And, uh, and my husband come in and he just said, I'm sorry, love, and he was crying. My mum was an, a midwife, you know, she'd seen all sorts of things through her nursing career. And uh, she said, you know, to the nurses, you know, well, where's my you know, son? And they said, well, we've just, uh, you know, we've taken him away. Uh, and one of the nurses said, and you won't see him. And there was the uh, cradle with uh, Louise lying in there that can only be described as a, as a torso with sort of little flowers where the arms and legs should be. And uh, after a few hours, I, I got myself together and I went back to the hospital to find uh, uh, Vicky, you know, in a terrible state and a priest in the room. He said, well, I'm explaining to Vicky that it's God's will. I said, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Not God's will at all. It's drugs, it's pills. Out. And I threw him out. There was a very low level of expectation when we were all born. Um, we were all written off and uh, my mother was told that I would probably only live for about six weeks. And in fact, when I was born, apparently, um, they thought I was still born. And I was put in some kind of a container and put, it, put under my mother's bed. And I don't know whether I coughed or someone knocked the box or something, there was some kind of movement. And then they realised I was, I was alive. What has also become clear is that a large number of babies were actually born alive, but they weren't allowed to live. The doctor came to me and said that 
My son was born handicapped. In fact, his arms and legs were short. Doctors and midwives were suffocating deformed babies or they were in the hospitals putting them out in the, the cold, on the cold slab in the cold room in the hope that they die quietly. He thought it would be best that I should go home and forget I'd ever had him and have another one straight away. My mother and father, thank God, had saved up enough from the dogs and my mother opened a small shop counting ra during rationing. So they'd accumulated enough money and they got me into a girls' college. How did I pull that off? I mean, the girls were learning shorthand and typing. They've got a shorthand stiffing of 120 words a minute. Can I get a job? In 1961, I was offered the editorship of the Northern Echo, a great daily newspaper in Darlington, circulation of more than 100,000, uh, which had once been edited by one of the greatest British journalists called W.T. Stead. In fact, I sat at the desk and there was a handwritten letter he wrote to his proprietors in the late 19th century saying, Thank you, what a marvellous opportunity for attacking the devil. No, this block, sorry. There's a story tying on with that one. Durham, there we are. Head above. He saw campaigns as the way ahead. He had a sharp eye for which issues to zero in on and began to develop techniques which would prove his hallmark. I read a paragraph like this in the Sunday Times to say that Vancouver was introducing a campaign, uh, no, introducing a program for what's called a pap smear to detect cervical cancer in women before it developed into a full cancer. And I thought, well, why don't we have one of those? The method had been known since the 1920s and was in use in many other countries. Death rates began to fall remarkably after the American Cancer Society introduced pap smears in 1957. Every year, 2,500 women died needlessly in the UK. So we began a campaign. He wrote editorials, articles and pamphlets and contacted every MP to try and persuade the government to have a screening programme in Britain. The Minister of Health at the time was Enoch Powell. And so the local MP, Jeremy Bray, got up and asked a question and said, uh, Minister, in the light of the articles in the Northern Echo, will the Minister agree to start a programme for the detection of cervical cancer in women? Mr Powell wrote, no, sir. OK, week after week, no, sir, no, sir, no, sir, no, sir. Here was a brilliant man without a heart. The drip, drip, drip campaign continued, week in and week out. Until finally the Ministry of Health was changed to Anthony Barper and he said, yes sir, I'll set up a pilot programme. The Northern Echo's cervical cancer campaign showed how a newspaper could persuade those in power to change their minds. To this day, tens of thousands of women owe their lives to the power of the press. And Harry found that there was no shortage of wrongs to be righted. He wasn't a boy of violent nature. He loved his wife and baby. What did he tell you at the time, though, when you went to see him in prison? He said, go and see Christy, ma'am. He's the only man can help me. He said, I never touched him. He said, Christy done it. 
At the time, the trial of Timothy Evans excited very little public interest. But three years after Evans had, had been hung, his trial took on a new and disturbing importance. In March 1953, the bodies of three strangled women were discovered here in this alcove in Christie's kitchen. They quickly executed Christie without really uncovering the true story, which was that Christie was a serial killer. He'd killed many women. He just happened to be in the same house with Evans. Questions were now being asked about the Evans verdict. Harry's involvement began when he was contacted by a local businessman in the Northeast. Herbert Wolf sent me an article, and I'm reading this article, and I'm so shocked. I went to see the Home Secretary who signed the death warrant, and I said, you signed the death warrant? He said, I, I did, and I regret it. We hanged the wrong man. I said, we've got to get it justice done. He said, you will never get it done against the forces of Whitehall. So I got hold of Herbert Wolf, and the two of us decided to work together. And we, I published one editorial, then another editorial, then another editorial. I commissioned articles on previous hangings that had gone wrong, the history of the death penalty, the life of Timothy Evans, etc., etc., etc. The Echo campaign lasted 12 months. Every edition of the paper was decorated with the Man on Our Conscience logo. Relentlessly, this drip, drip, drip went on until even the staff began to wonder if it was going to succeed. A newspaper campaign has to be prolonged very often because the forces of rigidity are strong, particularly in bureaucracies, and secondly, it takes time for the penny to drop. There's a famous American editor who said, the moment a newspaper man tires of his campaign is the moment the public is just beginning to notice it. Meanwhile, there was a growing consensus in the country that the time to abolish the death penalty had come. And finally, the Home Secretary was now a new man called Roy Jenkins, great reforming Home Secretary, and he announced that we'd have a public inquiry into the hanging. It was a model verdict, but nonetheless, it enabled Roy Jenkins to get up in the House of Commons and uh, announce a pardon. So we won. And at the same time, the death penalty was abolished. Now, I can't claim that we abolished the death penalty. Many campaigners had been on that, uh, particularly Sidney Sullivan. But I think we can say that Herbert Wolf and Ludovic Kennedy and Michael Eddowes and to some extent, myself, helped to speed up the process. By 1962, the full horror of thalidomide was obvious and the drug banned worldwide. The problem of tighter controls to prevent the distribution of dangerous drugs, such as thalidomide, is a matter of concern to the president at his news conference. He outlines the steps the government plans to take. Now, the Food and Drug Administration have had uh, nearly 200 people uh, working on this. Every doctor, every hospital, every nurse has been notified. Uh, every uh, woman uh, uh, in this country, I think, uh, must be aware that it's most important that they check their medicine cabinet and that, that they do not take this drug and that they turn it in. But unlike the American health authorities, the British Minister of Health, Enoch Powell, said no to a public inquiry, no to setting up a drugs testing center, no to issuing a warning against anyone using leftover pills, because he thought it a scaremongering publicity stunt, and no to giving a statement afterwards. No need to bring the press into this, he said. Mr. Enoch Powell had been asked if he would set up a public inquiry to discover how was it possible for a National Health Service doctor to prescribe a pill which was going to have these devastating effects. Mr. Enoch Powell said, no, sir. The three of my parents went to see him and had the same answer. And the civil servants gave him the same answer. Everybody gave the same answer. 
i.e. you're on your own. Powell's unwillingness to help them left the families with only one remedy, to sue the manufacturers for negligence. But the families had pitted themselves against a formidable opponent. Worth the equivalent today of four billion pounds, Distillers Group produced a raft of famous brands, including such household names as Johnny Walker Whiskey and Gordon's Gin. Its chairman, Alexander MacDonald, had gained a reputation as a man of granite. The families had to rely on public funding. But the government begrudged spending taxpayers' money on what it regarded as a weak case. Every single newspaper said the same thing. The Guardian, The Economist, The Times, The Telegraph, saying the same thing as the drug company, the Ministry of Health. What they were saying was this drug was tested according to the standards of the time when nobody thought a drug could cross the placental barrier and affect a fetus. And the solicitors representing the families had accepted this. So you can imagine, here you have the families represented by a, a legal firm who agrees with them that there's no case for the parents. You can't have a case of negligence because there's been no negligence because they did the standard test at the time. With no idea of the darker background to thalidomide, Harry ran a story in the Northern Echo in order to win sympathy for the children. I published these photographs expecting to evoke sympathy for the children. And what I got instead of sympathy was a criticism, uh, uh, not a, almost a denunciation. We do not want to see pictures like this in our newspaper. Please do not show us these scary things. Although most families were scared off by distillers' lawyers, 62 families did issue writs. Once the writs had been issued, though, it became illegal for the press to print facts or comment on a pending trial. With thalidomide, this meant that nothing could be published that might influence a judge until every case, every single case, had been settled by the courts. Whenever a, a rich company was had acted badly, they would sue. They would issue what we called a gagging writ, which gagged all criticism under the pretext that it was sub judice, that it was in court, so no one could comment critically on any of the parties. Distiller's response to the 62 families was to wait until just over three years to reach an out-of-court settlement, in which, although not accepting liability, they agreed to pay some compensation. Most of the other victims' families had no idea that a settlement had been in the offing. By design or happy coincidence, once the case had been settled and the press free to report, the three years' statute of limitations on personal damages had expired. The families of the other parents were deemed out of time and wouldn't be able to sue. One of the out of time parents was David Mason. David Mason, West End art dealer, a man who built up his business from scratch when he was earning three pounds a week, father of four, and one of them, one of the first thalidomide children, and the man who alone pitted himself against the multi-million pound might of the distiller's company. I can remember thinking, even in those days, when it was not a litigious society, I'm going after distillers and I'm going to make them accountable for all these deformities that they've caused with other children. I hadn't been told how many were involved but I knew that there were other children involved, were other victims and that was the start of it. It would also be a new start for Harry Evans. The campaigns of this obscure northern newspaper editor and in particular that of cervical cancer had caught the eye of the then editor of the Sunday Times, Dennis Hamilton, who was on the lookout for his successor. 
It had taken just 20 years from his first days at the Ashton Underline Reporter for the boy who failed his 11 plus to be offered the editorship of one of the most highly regarded newspapers in the world. Harry Evans' Sunday Times was a, a kind of golden age, not only because of the editorship, but also because of the proprietorship. So he edited under Lord Thompson, who was the last of the sort of grandee broadsheet press barons. Basically, most of my time on the Sunday Times was on investigative journalism. Working for him was fun. I got up every day with a sense of adventure going into the Sunday Times of what we're going to do this week. And whatever it was, it was going to be bright and it was going to cause people to, as they open their Sunday Times on Sunday morning, to say, wow. The Sunday Times employed its investigative journalists as part of a team known as Insight. Harry understood the importance of teams of journalists worrying away at really difficult long-term projects. News. It, it would have been very difficult to create, I uh, find it hard to imagine, with any other editor, though others have tried, not totally successfully. In only his second month as editor, Evans set his newly formed Insight team on an investigation that took eight months and was bitterly resisted. In 1951, British intelligence got alarmed about how the Soviets seemed to be one step ahead on British cooperation with the Americans over nuclear weapons. Two diplomats in Washington, Guy Burgess and Donald McLean, fled to Moscow before they could be questioned. Who tipped them off? Might Kim Philby be the third man? If there was a third man, were you, in fact, the third man? No, I was not. The Sunday Times took up the case because somebody had told the editor, Harold Evans, that uh, Philby, the Philby case, was far more important than anyone ever suspected. I mean, he must go down in history as the most remarkable uh, penetration agent in the whole history of espionage. He was well on the way to becoming head of British intelligence. My chairman, Dennis Hamilton, rang me up and said, you better be in the House of Commons tomorrow because the Foreign Secretary is going to denounce you as a traitor. All I will say is we've published nothing which is not already known to the Russians. The government was intent on us not telling the story because it was such a terrible mess. It was run by uh, incompetence and uh, of, of, from the old boy network. I remember once uh, the head of the service came when I was prime minister into my room, rubbing his and said, I've got that chap, I've got him, I've been after him for 18 months, and I looked very gloomy. And he said, aren't you pleased, prime minister? I said, I'm not at all pleased. Well, I said, we've been wonderful. Our chaps have knew he was a runner and got him. He also I said, but when the keeper shoots the fox here, he doesn't hang it up outside the master of Foxhound's house. What are we going to have now? We have an inquiry. You'll be told your service is rotten from top to bottom. We should have Lord Radcliffe as a commission. We have a debate in the House of Commons. The government will probably fall. You see, in war, you don't do those things. You put them quite their way. Harry Evans was an editor for the Sunday Times in a country that had an official secrets act. It was just the opposite of our freedom of information laws. That is, the, uh, the uh, presumption was secrecy in, uh, in the UK, in, instead of the presumption being openness, and then the government had to explain why some information was kept secret. So he was up against a very hostile atmosphere, which could have exposed him and his reporters to, literally to prosecution. staff at the Northern Echo, but nothing can compare the staff of people I had at the Sunday Times, who were not only more numerous, you know, more experienced. And... 
So I said, let's keep an eye on the thalidomide children. Although it had been reported that an agreement by distillers and the 62 families who'd sued in time had been agreed, the press were not allowed to report anything regarding the financial settlement, whilst the two unequal sides were in negotiations about what that level of compensation would be. And it was finally agreed by distillers that if the parents withdrew the charge of negligence, they would make a settlement of 40% of what a full settlement would be. So they go before a judge. This story keeps getting worse and worse. So they go before a judge to decide what would be a 100% settlement. And knowing that they're only going to get 40% of it, utterly and totally miserably inadequate. He thought he had no opportunity to help until the Sunday Times was contacted by a whistleblower who gave them 10,000 internal distillers' documents. What the documents revealed was a unscrupulous marketing campaign to market this drug. What they did not reveal was how the disaster had occurred. They'd been warned of its danger five months before it was eventually withdrawn. Those five months were the period in which the majority of victims were conceived. These documents definitely could not be published as they bore directly on a case before the courts. But a second set that came the Sunday Times' way had more potential. So we now have a Sunday Times room packed with filing cabinets with documents in German being translated. The second set were internal Kemi Grunenthal documents related to a case being brought against them in the German courts, in a size of trial not seen since Nuremberg. These documents catalogued a get-rich-quick mentality in which the safety of the drug had been the main selling point. Contagen was given to 370 test subjects, of whom 160 were nursing mothers. The report based on these trials stated that side effects were not observed either with mothers or babies. It cunningly implied that the babies were in the womb when the mothers took the drug. This was not true. That raised the first crisis for us. Could we publish the story of how the German company marketed a drug without proper testing? Because did that bear on the British case, and if we published the German story, would it be contempt of court? The lawyers pored over every word, bearing in mind that a breach of the contempt laws might see Harry wind up in jail. So we did get ready to publish the German case, and Godfrey Hodgson produced a fantastic, scary article, and I put on the front page of the review section five pages with a picture of one of the German doctors who had been involved with the Nazis. And I sat back in a defensive crouch, pretty sure we were going to get a contempt of court citation. For the first time, thalidomide was shown to be a corporate disaster rather than an act of God. But to Harry's frustration, the family's lawyers remained overawed by their opponents. Mindful that distillers threatened that they were quite prepared for the case to go to court because they were confident of victory, the family's lawyers weren't emboldened by the Sunday Times article, but settled on a fraction of what their clients needed. And the judge, a nice old man without a single clue, sets a level of compensation which is ridiculously low. Press reaction wasn't what Harry had expected either. The press headlined that as though the families had won the pools. Lottery, prizes, as though they'd won millions. Outraged by the inadequacy of the amount of money offered by distillers, he decided to skirt around the law and avoiding the subject of the company's negligence, published comment on the compensation. But even that was risky. I remember writing the headline, 
what price a pound of flesh? Arguing that the levels were not enough. And the lawyer said, I think that's contempt. Our own lawyer. I said, well, so be it. Help with it. <laughs> so we took the chance and published that article. That was 1969. The consequence of that settlement in 1969 was to suddenly alert a huge number of other families who hadn't realised that their children were thalidomide victims. They just thought they were unlucky. And they didn't know there was a prospect of a settlement. By the end of a couple of months, 369 families had joined the few from the beginning. So we now had close to 500 families. The 369 were too late to sue. But the courts agreed that even though they were out of time, they could sue. So one day, I got a letter through the post uh, saying that there was to be a meeting of all the thalidomide uh, parents. So we duly went to the meeting, and when we got there, of course, there were, I don't know, six, seven hundred people, something like that. The lawyers spelt out the terms of the offer. It was even less generous than the award given to the original 62 who'd settled. And they put pressure on the families to accept by saying that if it wasn't agreed to by all the parents, no one would get anything. He drew this thing out, and of course there were occasional rounds of applause from the parents, because let's face it, nobody thought they were ever going to get anything. And he said the mean figure of what it amounts to is three million pounds. So I said, three million pounds for 400 victims. So I worked it out quickly, and I, I came to the conclusion that that would mean with Louise, 8,000 pounds, or putting it crudely, £2,000 per arm and per leg. The outcome of the meeting was mixed. We had on one hand... Financially, David Mason was in the fortunate position that he could afford to reject the offer. The but many of the parents were in a desperate plight. Distillers applied enormous emotional pressure, but Mason and a few others remained firm. There were five parents, one of them famous, David Mason, an art dealer, and others said, I'm not going to accept that. I'm not going to accept this compensation for my daughter, Louise, which is inadequate. Why should I? And Distiller's answer was, you're sacrificing everybody else's compensation. Well, you parents are happy with the settlement that's well, been discussed. Well, well, certainly the settlement. settlement. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly we are. Uh, I received threatening letters. I received threatening phone calls. I was referred to by certain other parents as being unchristian. Mr. Mason does claim, in fact, that he represents most of the... He does not parents. claim, and it was proved in there just now. He might claim to be the spokesman for a few, but for the vast majority of parents, he doesn't represent them at all. Mason had been advised that a figure of 20 million pounds, nearly seven times the amount offered by distillers, was the minimum required for the long-term care of the children. But many of the other parents could not afford to hold out. It just went from bad to worse. He had no wheelchair. He had no helmet. He had, mm. up, when I say nothing, I took letters from the pea bucket and tomatoes and washed them and brought them home. And they lived on that for the weekend. My parents were just typical working class parents. My dad worked on the tugs on the River Mersey. And my mother was a housewife bringing up six kids. So they had no idea about class actions or lawyers or, you know, suing people in court. It must have been a massive struggle for them, really. You know, they had the burden of taking on the court cases and everything, and I just got on with my childhood. Distillers identified David Mason as the ringleader of the small group standing out against a deal being struck. And they increased the pressure by threatening to withdraw their offer. Divide and rule seemed to be the order of the day. And the next dreadful thing that uh, happened was that uh, I received a writ through the post. Distillers took me into the court and tried to take my daughter away from me 
and have her made a ward of court on the grounds that by refusing this offer I was acting against her best interest. Therefore, if they made her a ward of court, the official solicitor would act for her, the official solicitor would sign off on Louise and everybody would get their money. Mason lost custody of his daughter, but he appealed and a date was set for the court case. Along with their own action, distillers financed the legal teams of some of the parents who wanted to settle. The crux of their argument being that no successful claims had been made anywhere in the world and that Mason was acting unreasonably. Their method of defense was to launch an attack. Justice Hinchliffe removed Mason's, removed the parental rights of Mason and the others. His, his, his children were now consigned to the Treasury solicitor. It's like Bleak House is not in it. Through a mutual friend, David Mason was introduced to the Daily Mail's editor, David English, who, moved by the story, agreed to publish a series of articles on <coughs> Mason's struggle. Hello. Yes, David Mason. But he warned that if he proceeded, the distiller's deal may be withdrawn and the other parents would be out for his blood. Out came the first edition of the Daily Mail. Wham! Well, they ran for four days, double page spread, spelling out exactly what had gone on, and all hell was let loose. And the Attorney General was running around, injunctions were being sought, God knows what, and eventually an injunction was obtained. Nobody would talk to David Mason after that. The Daily Mail was told by the Attorney General it was liable for a contempt prosecution and it dropped it. As the appeal date loomed, Mason was contacted by an American lawyer who had read one of the Daily Mail articles. Distillers had argued that no one had ever won a case for compensation against the makers of thalidomide, and therefore Mason was acting unreasonably, like a barrack room lawyer in pursuing his claim. But the American had won just such a case in the US. With only the weekend before he was due back in court, Mason flew to America, where he was given copies of the court papers. He arrived back in the UK on the morning his appeal was to be heard and got the papers in front of the judge, Lord Denning. Denning came in, put his papers on the table, bad-tempered way, and sat down and said, now then, he said, I'd like all the people representing the other parents he said, and distillers, to stand up. He said, do you recall having told me, having told this court, that no case had ever taken place anywhere in the world with a successful outcome? Uh, yes. He said, well, he said, I have to tell you, I have the court record that, that Mr. Mason found over the weekend. What do you got to say about that? We did, you didn't, you didn't what? You didn't know about it, you didn't, you didn't know about it. He said, well, for a, a barrack lawyer, a man of perverse views, he said, Mr. Mason hasn't done bad, has he? So there was a sort of silence. He said, I'm adjourning the court. Bottom line, I won her back. I won her back. Although David Mason had won a personal victory, the press was still muzzled on the wider issues regarding the compensation. In the end, he refused to waste his time giving interviews that never appeared spiked by newspapers' lawyers citing contempt of court. The thalidomide children receded back into the vacuum of silence, exactly where distillers wanted them. Anthony, I've got a letter from the chairman of distillers. I'll read it to you. Thank you for your letter of the 23rd of June. And from time to time, you become absolutely convinced you're going to achieve something. I didn't always expect that, but in the Philidomide case, I did, because it seemed to me it was so transparently an injustice. Phil Knightley stayed on the story, keeping in touch with the parents. And that moment when he came into my office and said, they're being offered half of what they are entitled to by comparison with an earlier judgment. That was when I decided to start the campaign. Harry Evans, 
If necessary, I'll run a story about the Lidamide for the next 10 years to get justice for these children. Now, I know that sounds like a, a film script, but that's what he said. Harry decided it was time to contact the most prominent thalidomide parent. He had an idea of the next step, so he sent Philip Knightley to see him. He said, I want you to come down to the Sunday Times. He said, and uh, meet Harold Evans and meet some of the board. And he said, I'm on the inside team. He said, and we think we have a way of freeing you up and helping you. James Evans, no relation of Harry Evans, but was their lawyer, had found a way through. Our argument throughout was contempt is about prejudicing the legal issues in a case. If you steer clear of those, but advance the moral arguments, then you should be allowed to do this. Now, there was no decision on, on this, and uh, we just had to take a bit of a chance on it. And this provided us with the opportunity to, to write about to write about the Lidomide on a from a moral point of view, rather than from the negligence point of view. I mean, it should be quite a short hearing. James Evans saw it as his job not to stop us publishing things which were in the public interest, but to justify them. Once we've satisfied it was in the public interest, then to find a justification in law for getting round the most restrictive press laws in Western democracy. He was so calm, he said, I get the picture. Tourist says, find me a safe way up the Eiger. One wanted to be sure that one took the editor up this sort of, as it were, north face of the Eiger by the safest possible route. Uh, but of course, uh, the editor carries the can here. Harry and James spent late nights making sure they'd covered every base, because this was a very big risk for both the paper and its editor. I asked him to draft an editorial, because he's a top lawyer, and he drafted an editorial, which I made very little, few changes. And I wrote the headline, Children on Our Conscience, and launched the moral campaign. As the Insight team compiled the first article, Harry prepared to contact the great and the powerful in order to enlist support for the campaign. He broke the news to Joan. So he said, Joan, we're going to have to write to every single MP a separate letter. He didn't want photocopies being sent to all the MPs. So I just set about typing 620 or 30 letters. He, he hammered the point, really, that it was such an injustice to the children. The phone rang, it was the advertising director. And I believe you're going to go ahead with uh, this strong attack on distillers. I want you to know that they spend £60,000 with advertising with the Sunday Times. He, he broke new ground in terms of focusing on the very corporations whose advertisements funded the newspaper's profit. He said, it won't stop you, I know, and it shouldn't. I brought David Mason in to the office to see the presses going around with the story, which he couldn't believe would ever happen. And he said, I want to show you the power of the press. And we went downstairs, and uh, there was silence in the room. And he said, see that button? Push it. And all these papers just poured off. gave me one of the first copies, which I still have. His 
uh, generosity, his kindness, his compassion, his, his brilliance as a journalist, his, the way he was able to get a cohesive team about him, the way he was able to motivate people. That was the best thing that happened to the campaign. Harry Evans coming on board. No sooner had we published than a deafening silence came over every other newspaper. I can remember being at the BBC, the only place which would even interview us, a lawyer at my shoulder. I mean, the, the, these children exist in the real world and we mustn't uh, be put off telling the public about the plight of the children. The only person we heard from was the Attorney General. What the hell are you playing at? Publishing this stuff is contempt of court. What prompted the threat was a line at the bottom of the first story, which promised future articles on the origins of the tragedy. By implication, an expose of distiller's negligence. It wasn't the thought of avoiding jail which was uppermost. Any fool can go to prison. I certainly would have been prepared to do it. But if we'd published a single article and gone to prison, end of campaign, no, no, no further money for the children or anything, no further public discussion. So we tried to avoid that throughout all time. We wanted to sustain the campaign. Thalidomide was a campaign from the outset. He never envisaged just doing one piece. In fact, what we all learnt, learnt from Harry is that a single investigation did not deliver. I think it might not be a bad idea also to write, I'll write to the stillers today. It, it was three-pronged. The, there was the whole the legal story, uh, the investigation into into the drug, and of course the families who were at the heart of, of everything. We were so overstretched that we decided we'd get somebody in just to pursue the families, and that's when Marjorie came in. Well, my role was to go round the country and stay with and interview and experience what it was like to have a thalidomide child at that time. I would go along and I would actually lie on the floors of some of their houses and know what it was like to have to wake up every moment in the night and turn a thalidomide child over who couldn't turn themselves. By living their lives with them, living and experiencing what they experienced, I felt I understood what it was like to have a child with these deformities. When I started finding the thalidomide children and their families, some of them were very hard to track down and some of them certainly didn't want to be interviewed. It was a very difficult task and what I did find was stories that the very bleak circumstances. They were receiving very little help, very little recognition, and they were being shunned by society. Everyone was afraid. They were afraid of these deformities of the children. And not only was it just the arms and legs, some of the children had were like a jigsaw, a jumbled jigsaw of displaced organs. I would know what it was like just taking a child into a cafe, say, and within minutes, within seconds, you look round and the queue had evaporated. Or I would go along with them, say, to a crowded beach, and within minutes, it was a deserted beach. Marriages broke up. Husbands walked out. That creature's got nothing to do with me. But one day, my husband, I can't say in front of my husband, can you hear me? Yeah. Said to me, we've got to talk. And I said, yeah, we can talk. I couldn't believe what he said. He said, you have a choice. I said, what? I said, no. I said, that's a choice I will never make. So I said, uh, he said, otherwise, son. I said, well, that you'll have to do. I'm not going to give up on this one. And that's what he did. And I was left with a big mortgage. I was left with the children small. And I didn't want them affected by the epilepsy. And I knew I had to think and think very hard. 
and I got that night duty, 12 hour shift every night, and I did that for 16 years without ever going to bed. And for some reason, I was never tired. Somebody's looking after me. What happened with the Sunday Times, Harry Evans, he would put these photographs on the pages of the newspaper that everyone else would say was unacceptable. But by doing so, he really liberated many of the families. The doctors said this had been caused by me eating lamb that had been infected from a nuclear fallout. We suspected when we saw the first article by Harold Evans. We wrote to the Times and got information from them. And without that, we wouldn't have known. The moral campaign had shone a light on the lives of the thalidomide victims, but still the threat of legal action by the Attorney General hung over the Sunday Times. The real turning point in the campaign was I got a letter from the Attorney General one day. The Attorney General has decided not to proceed against you on what you've already published, the moral campaign, but if you go ahead with the rest of what you've said, take care. We, the implication be, will then sue you. The Attorney General's letter to Harry allowing the moral campaign effectively granted the same right to MPs. Jack Ashley and Alf Morris had been supporters of the campaign from the very first. In Parliament, they had been the main driving force behind trying to persuade the Speaker to grant a debate. That day, that very day, Jack Ashley was going to see the Speaker in the House of Commons to say, look, let's have a debate on this. These, these children are not getting proper compensation. And the next day, the Speaker agrees to give up parliamentary time from the Labour Party for a debate on thalidomide. That's the moment. Before the debate, I was stopped in the corridor by the Prime Minister's personal assistant. He said, we'd like you not to go ahead with your campaign. And we've arranged for an extra five million pounds, but don't go ahead. So I said, I'm sorry, it's not enough. I said, I want, we need 20 million. I'm advised we need 20 million. Jack Ashley opened with words that moved members on all sides of the house. We are debating today a great national tragedy, nonetheless poignant because it happened 10 years ago. But what kind of adolescence will a 10-year-old boy look forward to when he has no arms, no legs, and is only two feet tall? That is the height of two whiskey bottles placed one on top of the other. How can an 11-year-old girl look forward to laughing and loving when she has no hand to be held and no legs to dance on? So we had the debate, and that was absolutely stunning because now the press having been scared, either scared of contempt or competitively jealous, whatever, would now report in the case. We now had a case also, what was now very important, as distinct from when I was editing Northern Echo and got complaints, I now got thousands of letters saying, please continue. I think there was definitely a, a uh, maybe not a day, but definitely a week when the fight changed from nobody knowing about it to you know, the population of England realising that something was happening. Once free to report, much of the press joined with the Sunday Times in condemning how the children had been treated. Now informed at what had been going on, the public were shocked and disgusted. The floodgates opened and distillers reeled. Distillers were on the back foot, trying to limit the damage and the amount of compensation they would have to pay. They responded by apparently raising their offer from anywhere between five and 11 million pounds. But these were exposed as little more than accountancy tricks, designed for them to pay as little as possible. Within a very short time, the plight of the children became a national talking point. People wanted to help in any way they could. 
a small group of people decided to appeal to the individual shareholders directly. When they approached distillers to buy a list of the names, the company, who were legally bound to comply, said the volumes would cost £2,000, a figure well beyond their reach. They turned to Harry for help. So they came to up my office <coughs> uh, with Knightley's encouragement, and we bought the shareholders. I the, spent Sunday Times money buying the lists of names of the shareholders so we could write them. It was like a general election. I mean, the phone would go, and uh, people would say, uh, we represent Ealing Council, we have so many shares, we support Mason, and uh, so it went on. So I thought, well, this is great. Another person who made a huge difference was Ron Peet, who headed the legal and general company. I was speaking as an institutional investor, and I thought that it would be in the shareholders' interest if distillers were to make some sort of reasonable offer. And he, amazing, he got up and, and made a speech in the city, as I recall. Their products had clearly done a vast amount of harm, and they were not admitting any moral liability, which I thought there was. It is now evident and has been made clear that we have the necessary 10% of the voting power needed to serve upon distillers notice for them to call an extraordinary general meeting. And indeed, the share price for distillers started to tumble and fall because by now we've had the huge debate in Parliament, we've got the continuing campaign in the Sunday Times with photographs and Marjorie Wallace's stories and stuff, and we got, as our high explosive pack, the Bruce Page and Lane Potter documentation of the fact that there was really was negligence here. As press and the public's anger built, so did the pressure on distillers. Individuals and retailers started to boycott their products. Many companies, big and small, offered whatever they could to aid the Sunday Times campaign. Well, I personally have been very concerned about this for a long time. And with all this, uh, as I call it, lack of understanding for the feelings of the people involved, then somebody has got to take a step. Customers were turning against distillers' products. And there were these stories going around about people going into the duty-free shop at Heathrow to buy whiskey, and when asked what they wanted, they said they didn't mind as long as it wasn't distillers. And that didn't seem to me to be very good for shareholders. Harry's moral campaign had grown to such an extent that it caught the eye of American consumer rights champion, Ralph Nader, who offered his support. Mr. Nader, how are you? Nice of you to phone. David Mason asked me if I could help him with the consumer groups in the United States to put pressure on distillers uh, to up their paltry compensation. So I decided to go over to America. I got Ralph Nader to agree to see me. David Mason will be meeting Ralph Nader later tonight, and they're expected to hold a joint press conference later to announce what action they plan to take. And I got on this Pan Am flight and I was sitting there, and then there was this announcement. They said, well, um, ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to the drinks trolley be going round, and we can offer you Johnny Walker's whiskey and Gordon's gin and this and that. I thought, what? So I, got, I thought, I'm not standing for this. So I followed the drinks trolley round the cabin. So when somebody said, I'd like a, a Gordon's gin, I'd say, well, I'm David Mason, this is it. And I had the newspaper things, and they'd say, well, I'll have another drink. I followed the drinks trolley all the way around the plane, and not one person bought a distiller's product. Now, the importance of that was very, was absolutely huge. All you had to do was uh, develop enough of an antipathy, maybe 5% of sales reduction, and these companies would pay attention because you, you're dealing with hundreds of millions of dollars. And once a stigma is attached to a brand name, and that brand name involves alcoholic beverages, which are easily abandoned uh, in favor of similar alcoholic beverages, uh, the message was quite clear to distillers. And uh, there were all loads of press, CBS, NBC, you name it, they were all out there. Uh, Harold Evans had done a great job of laying it on with the press over in America. What they're really after in the complicated uh, accounting uh, processes of, of these companies is, is, to, is to pay out just enough to avoid having any net cost to the company. Uh, now, the significance of the boycott 
is that it talks the language of Mr. McDonald, who understands, as they say, pounds and pence. And one chap stood up and he said, Mr. Nader, he said, the realities of bringing about a boycott, he said, are very far reaching and huge. And just to set it up would take forever. And I said, I think I can answer that because I was flying over here on a Pan Am flight and the following thing happened. And I started to recount what had happened on this Pan Am flight and how everybody boycotted the... Pro well, th th they just loved it. And Ralph was looking at me absolutely, because I hadn't told him about it. And everybody was, everybody was laughing and, and he said, well, there we are, Mr. Mason's just, just carried it forward and shown you how it can be done. And David was extremely articulate. Uh, one should never underestimate the role of, of a handful of the parents who broke through their grief and became uh, eloquent advocates for their cause. The Sunday Times moral campaign wasn't just going to fade away. In nine days, distillers' shares lost 35 million pounds in value. This was arithmetic Edinburgh understood. We began the campaign in September 1972. Three, four months later, distillers came in. And they offered the 20 million. Uh, the we were told that the Treasury had to tax it. So I wrote an editorial the same day, saying this would be unthinkable. And Harold Wilson, the next day, gave an extra five million so that no tax had to be paid. I remember being in the paper, on the press. I remember um, the strain on, on the family. And I also remember meeting Harry at, at my house. I didn't know who he was. I thought it was a rather strange man to start off with. And the fact that he and my dad and the rest of the campaign, you know, the rest of the campaign team finally did get the compensation. That was so important to us. You know, I remember saying that at, <coughs> that at the end of the day, there were no medals to be won because the victims still had no arms and no legs. We received the compensation and the trust fund was set up around the same time because they were aware, Howard Evans was very aware that we would need that money for the rest of our lives. But the settlement was not universally acclaimed by other commentators who didn't know the full facts. Peregrine Worth saw another saying, Harold Evans is like a Robin Hood. He's just, you know, a bandit holding people up. AJP Taylor. The famous historian said, this is outrageous what the Sunday Times is doing. So it was very, very important, therefore, to for two reasons. One, to show what had happened, and two, to learn. If we don't learn from this drug disaster, which we should have learned in 1962, we should have, 1963 we should have learned, 1964, and we're now in 1973, and we still haven't learned what the cause of the disaster. It's really incredible. Well, this is this is the uh, chemical breakup of it. Although they had won the moral victory and proper compensation, the true story about the drug had yet to be told. The Insight team carried on with their forensic investigation into the hidden causes of the disaster and started to compose the most explosive piece of all: thalidomide, the story they suppressed. After the the September the twenty fourth article appeared. It was only after that uh, that we, we really began the investigation. The first question to ask was why did distillers want to license the drug? They had little history of pharmaceuticals. The thing about distillers was that they were new to drugs. Thalidomide was practically the first drug they'd ever handled. 
and they'd read an article, which I think actually appeared in the Sunday Times, uh, written by Aldous Huxley, a, a sort of brave new world account of what was going to happen, a sort of futurologist sort of piece, saying that drugs were going to replace alcohol. And they, they sort of had a bit of a panic, and they thought, well, we better do something about this. And that is, that is why they got into drugs. The investigation looked to challenge the distiller's claim about the tests carried out in that era. We looked to see which drug companies did what and what they knew about drugs in the 50s. I then went to America and I went around all the major drug companies f finding out what they knew before marketing new drugs. And what we very quickly learnt and confirmed was that the serious companies, the companies which had been in the business for a long time, did reproductive studies actually looking to see whether they produced damage to the fetus. Lederly, Hoffman LaRoche, Smith, Klein and Fridge, they all did reproductive studies. And ICI here, ICI actually went to the level of using primates, uh, which was very serious indeed. In 1957, distillers had sent the drug for independent testing. The results warned that it could cause damage to the thyroid gland, a known cause of birth defects. But they still went ahead. Bruce Page went to extraordinary lengths to understand the complex details of how the drug actually worked. One of the things you've got to understand about, about um, the testing of drugs is even now, with the best possible technology, it isn't foolproof, but you can say that nature usually provides warning signs around desperate chemicals. And almost any time you look at thalidomide, it shows up bad. It's a very complex little molecule, it exists in strange forms, and its actions are very unpredictable. Thalidomide is asymmetric. And that's, in the words of Dr. Robert Smith, I call of St. Mary's Hospital, he said, just look at that. That's a nasty molecule. There's something wrong with it. Goon and Toll were really, really bad at drug testing, and distillers knew nothing about it at all. The intersection of this bunch of soap makers, which is what they had been with the bunch of whiskey makers in Britain, was a horrible one-off disaster. The Minister of Health at the time, Mr Enoch Powell, instead of rushing to the defence of the parents, doesn't have a public inquiry and is briefed or receives a briefing which is basically the distiller's case and accepts it. Yes, the civil servant who briefs Powell is himself briefed by a senior man at distillers. Finally, the investigation was complete. The results, damning. But still, the Sunday Times was prevented from publishing it because an injunction was in place. And you can't tell me now what was going on in I the I can't summer. tell you, no. I'm bound by the injunction as anybody else's. Did they have research facilities, laboratories, for testing drugs, that sort of thing? Not on the scale that would have been necessary to market a drug like thalidomide in Britain. But nonetheless, they did market it? Yes, they went ahead and marketed it. And uh, how that came about is the part that you can't tell? That's what I'm not allowed to tell. We're already on touchy ground here. Uh, the details of why they actually picked on thalidomide, why they went to Kemi Grunenthal, uh, what tests they did on the drug before marketing on animals, uh, what tests they did, did to, to see how the drug was absorbed into the human system, what tests they did to see whether it was safe for pregnant women to take before advertising it as such, uh, what clinical trials they did and the results of those clinical trials I can't discuss. However, building on the Insight team's research, the Thalidomide Trust and others have finally, but only recently, began to uncover the full story of the drug's development. They looked into how the owners of Kemi Grunenthal had had the resources to set up a pharmaceutical division when all around them was rubble. 
they discovered that they were paid up members of the Nazi party who'd exploited the Aryanization program in order to buy up Jewish owned companies at a fraction of their value. According to the company's records, it only took eight weeks from starting to develop their wonder drug to the first patent for thalidomide being filed. This seemed a suspiciously short amount of time. In all likelihood, the scientists involved had been working on these compounds prior to the war. Hitler ordered one of those scientists to develop an antidote. After the war, Otto Ambros went on to work at Chemie Grunenthal. Now, Otto Ambros was known as the devil's chemist, and he was the man who decided that there should be a big concentration camp at a place called Auschwitz. We looked at thalidomide, and we looked at the claim that it was a, a completely new type of compound, and we discovered instead that, in fact, it was one of thousands of similar compounds and, and some of them well-known drugs that went back to the 1940s and the 1930s. We got hold of the earliest patents for thalidomide, and we showed them to one of our experts and he looked at the description of the effects of this chemical and said, how did they know that? And the effects he was looking at were five different effects on the nervous system. These five separate descriptions show that the writers of the patent knew that the drug acted on the nervous system in such a way that it caused the slowing down of muscle movements, creating a sedating effect. It reduced the metabolism, heartbeat, circulatory and digestive systems, with effects on the immune system. There was no legal way in which they could have tested this chemical on humans before they wrote this patent and in any event, in post-war Germany, that would have been illegal. Although we have no direct evidence that thalidomide was used or tested in the camps, there is a lot of circumstantial evidence. And one of the startling stories we heard was from the mother of one of our thalidomiders. It was my brother-in-law, who was one of the first in Tibelsen concentration camp, who liberated them. It was only nearing the end of his life that he said, you know, that's where I saw babies with deformities like thalidomide. He said some were living, only just, and others were very dead. But he says they had been obviously giving it to the mothers of these children. This is the doctor in charge of the female section of the concentration camp. Bergen Belsen. She adds that various medical experiments were made on the prisoners. Doctors gave some of them intravenous injections. And it was when we started looking at the patents for similar compounds in the 1940s that we realized that all of these drugs were being tested for their anticonvulsant effects. And this, this made sense only in an era where people were trying to find antidotes for the nerve poisons. This clothing will protect the wearer from contact with liquid nerve agent as well as from nerve agent vapor. And if symptoms of nerve agent poisoning appear, you have still another form of protection, your atropine injector. This is to be used only after symptoms of nerve agent poisoning appear. Any potential antidote to the nerve gases would have to have been designed to temporarily deaden the victim's nervous system. 
However, this effect would have catastrophic consequences for a baby developing in the womb. The way the drug damaged the babies was acting as a nerve poison. And the, the thalidomide molecule gets into the, the baby just as its nervous system is starting to form and kills the developing nerve end. And it does it with great precision. The nervous system begins developing around day 20. So on day 20 to 21, uh, the, the baby is liable to have severe brain damage. And at day 21 to 22, it may remove one or both of the eyes and damage the remaining eye. And at 23, it'll take away the hearing. And it may remove the ears, it may damage the inner ear, the middle ear, the outer ear, and it may do those in random combinations. And around day 24, it'll begin removing the arm system. So it begins with a complete removal of the arms until by 28, it'll just be damaged to the hands and wrists. And around day 30, it'll be the removal of the legs or severe damage to the legs down to day 35, where it'll be moderate damage to the legs and feet. So thalidomide attacks the embryo almost with the precision of a sniper's rifle, with the effects changing day by day. So thalidomide was a byproduct of the Nazi chemical warfare program. It only stood out from the other compounds developed at the time because it acted as an addictive sedative that gave the user a high. So I took them, which they did, they was good, don't get me wrong. I was smashing when I, when I took them, you know, I felt real good. The crimes with which these men are charged were not committed in rage or under the Ambrose was implicated in serious war crimes involving the deaths of tens of thousands of people. Men. But by the time of the Nuremberg trials in 1946, the Allies were overwhelmed by war criminals. Otto Ambrose. Ambrose. Although some Nazi scientists were executed, most punishments were relatively lenient. Otto Ambrose could no longer go and work in the top companies in the industry, and that's why they were working around smaller businesses like Grunenthal. Inexplicably, in December 1970, the judges at the trial of executives of Chemie Grunenthal suspended what was by then the longest criminal trial in German history. After two and a half years in court, the accused were neither exonerated nor found guilty. The question of criminal responsibility has never been concluded. The Page Potter article was finally completed and the presses ready to roll. But the Sunday Times were told they couldn't publish and an injunction was issued by the Attorney General. They appealed and won. The case then went to the House of Lords. So we're now in the House of Lords, and I'm sitting there with my colleagues, and the final conclusion of the judge is the following. Just listen to this. The article will be banned. It is perfectly all right for the Sunday Times to have conducted a moral campaign but it is illegal to publish the facts on which the moral campaign was based. <laughs> so we've now lost in the House of Lords. So what do we do? So we appeal to the European Commission of Rights that Harold Evans, representing my colleagues, of course, had been denied free speech under Article 10 of the Human Rights Act. So we then got him bumpy airplane rides to Strasbourg week after week after week to argue the case before the court. And we won by, really, by two votes. Mr Evans, just how significant do you think this judgment is today? Tremendous. It's the most important judgment for the, not only for the freedom of the press, but for the citizens' right to know in England. The most distinguished group of judges have told the British government, reform the laws. They've got to do it now. 
that was Harry's greatest achievement, I think, to change British law in favour, if you like, of press freedom, in favour, give more power to the powerless, in a sense, by enabling investigative journalism to continue despite a gagging writ. superb today. We're well ahead. Everything's pretty well. Everything is set. Everybody who we wanted to, to comment has said no, and we'll say that on the front page. And in the meantime, I must get on with it. It's the right number of words, is it? I think it's over. I, my guess is that we're probably two or three columns over, but how can you deal with ten years of nonsense and silence and secrecy? Insight Team's expose of distillers was finally published. It was the culmination of a long battle and a significant step towards liberating what Harry famously called the half free press. There's something about the institutional weight of a newspaper that has to stand behind reporting. Um, and that, that, is, that is the fourth estate. And I think that's, that's the thing that I most fear about the digital age, is, is that you lose that counterbalancing force of, of what the institutional weight of the press standing behind reporting, uh, whether it's against countries or corporations or governments. Uh, and it, you know, I think Harry Evans in some ways embodies that. In 2005, Harry was given the post of editor-at-large for Thomson Reuters, the world's largest news agency, where he once again works under the proprietorship of the Thomson family. Every newspaper editor's face should be marked with his features removed and a big question mark superimposed. Does he have curiosity? He needs to have a sense of purpose. What is he in the game for? Is it to maximize money? Is it to maximize his own reputation? What is it for? Once it de gets defined by the making of money only, let's say we need it, we need to be sustained. But once it's defined by the making of money, there are no inhibitions. Anything makes money is justified. To my way of thinking, which sounds a bit like a Boy Scout, that's not a sufficient definition of a good editor and a sufficient guidance. fantastic story uh, can only begin by my saying to everybody here but beginning first with the mothers whom we often think oh that there were the mothers yeah the mothers giving birth to you much as you were loved it was a shock and the fathers most of whom were good some of whom were not and of course you and I just think it's absolutely astonishing and amazing to me that those babies I first saw when I was editor of the Northern Echo are now here 
making lives. So if we never won a penny of compensation, that would be an amazing reward. So congratulations to you. He changed the dynamic and the intention of what was going on in the rest of the world, where the fault was with the parents. You know, countries were saying that, well, the mothers took the drug, it's their fault the children are like this. But Harold Evans came along and he said, no, this is the fault of the pharmaceutical companies and they're the ones who must pay. And he took the blame away from the parents, which is a massive thing because any parent will always blame themselves for the way their child turns out. Thank you so very much. He took that responsibility away and that guilt and he made it very clear that it was the pharmaceutical company, distillers, and not the parents who were at fault. There was a daily mirror front page. I will remember as long as I live the day I read in that paper about that injunction, that writ, and about what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. He was determined to go on the big boys, and you know, the bigger they are, the harder the fall, oh, which he proved. Oh. He's only a little guy, but my God, he has missed to perfection, mm -hmm. missed to oh, Sunday oh. times. Without him, we didn't stand it. We didn't stand a chance. The ever complex, multifaceted, changing, thrilling nature of the mosaic of news. And that's how I got into journalism. Let me make the following statement on behalf of the government. I know many thalidomiders have waited a long time for this. It is agreed with the National Advisory Council of the Thalidomide Tr Trust. The government wishes to express its sincere regret and deep sympathy for the injury and suffering endured by all those affected when expectant mothers took the drug thalidomide between 1958 and 1961. It was like the world stood still. Everything just stopped. When Mike O'Brien, the health minister, started his statement of regret, it was kind of like, I, I, the only way I can describe it, it's like everything went into alignment. The challenges that many continue to endure, often on a daily basis. I've waited my whole life to hear this apology. And finally, I've heard it. And then I flew out to New York that night on the 6 p.m. flight. Next morning, I went banging around to Harold Evans' house. And it was so exciting, because for everything that Harold had managed to do for us, one thing he hadn't been able to do was get that apology. So we watched it together, and we just had our arms wrapped around each other, and we were just crying, staring at, the, at his little computer screen, watching Mike O'Brien make his apology.